Hello, everyone. I'm Miles O'Brien for My Radar, and it's an historic moment in the world of space exploration. For the first time ever, human beings have seen exactly what it looks like to land a spacecraft on the surface of Mars in high resolution detail, stunning detail, really. And if you think about it, the people who do this and make it look easy at the Jet Propulsion Lab have never actually seen this before. They've thought about it, they've imagined it, they built machines to do it, but they could only imagine what it looked like until this moment. And right at the center of this whole thing, the guy who's been watching every frame, frame by frame, and probably will continue to do that for quite some time, is the entry, descent, and landing lead, Al Chen. Al Thanks for your time and congratulations on the great pictures we're about to show everybody. You must be feeling good. Yeah, we're on cloud nine here. It's been uh, it's been an amazing weekend looking at all the pictures coming down and finally get a chance to see what it's like to land on Mars. I mean, it's uh, we've been waiting our whole careers for this. All right. So just before we roll the video, let's give people a little bit of setup. This actually goes uh, the the deputy um, project managers, daughter, eleven year olds, gymnast using GoPro style cameras, sports cameras, and he gets the idea, wouldn't it be cool to put these on the uh, rover as it descends? And, and when, you, when you first heard about that, what were you, went through your mind, first of all? I thought it'd be extremely exciting to really see what it'd be like on landing, but I was a little fearful. Um, we've in the past uh, tried to put things on, but then got uh, kind of scared about what it might do to us uh, in terms of landing and whether that would present any risk to us in the landing event itself. Uh, so I'm really excited that we managed to get it on there and get it on there safely. And it didn't in interfere at all with us landing on Mars. It's kind of the space version of the Hippocratic Oath, right? First, do no harm, right? You don't want to do anything that messes up the main event, which is the science after all, right? Absolutely, right? Nothing can happen uh, with a mission if we don't land successfully. So we take no chances at all. Um, and if we had uh, if we had any concerns that this was going to be a problem for us or add risk to our landing system, we would not have done it. Um, this is, uh, it's very important for us to make sure that the number one job is clear and that's landing safely. All right. We, but uh, all's well that ends well, of course. You have four cameras, one on the back shell looking up toward the parachute, one on the on other side of the back shell looking down toward the spacecraft. And then you have uh, one on the spacecraft looking up, right? The, the rover itself. And then yeah, one looking it. down, right? Is that how it goes? Yeah, we had three cameras actually looking up at the parachute uh, from okay. the top of the back shell. Uh, and then we had one camera looking uh, down from the descent stage at the rover, uh, one camera on the rover on the top of the rover looking up at the descent stage, and then only another camera looking down at the ground on the rover. So kind of looking okay. every direction we could possibly imagine. And, and with that, uh, we'll go, I'm going to share my screen and we're going to show you what this all looks like. Uh, it is uh, some stunning stuff. And uh, I am not, uh, this share screen is not, uh, oh, hang on. Oh, I know what it is. Okay, quick time player, there we go. Okay, so here we are. Hopefully, are you seeing white screens with uh, 30% and, re okay, good. All right, let me uh, get this a little bit more centered here. I'm gonna play this and then we'll go back, all right? Let's just look at it and, and you can tell me what we're seeing as we go along then we can go back and dissect it a little bit. And here it goes. Okay, so real time to the right, 30% so speed to the left. At any left. time here, it's kind of, yeah. All right, so let me go back. Are you able to see it Hard okay to see, there? It's uh, kind of chunky. It kind of jumped between uh, nothing to full inflate pretty quick, but uh, uh, okay. back up, we can see it. We can pick out a whole bunch of things actually that we've noticed. Okay, so And this is just go. one of the two parachute cameras we have video from. All right, so look at this. I want to, let's look at this still right here on the left. This is, um, up here, yeah. can you see where my pointer is? What is that right there? Yeah, that's the parachute pack itself. So the parachute is actually packed into this bag. Um, so we got a, about 150 pounds of parachute uh, packed into a, a bag that's a little sm smaller than an oil drum. So it's kind of got the, uh, the the same density as a, as a piece of oak. Um, so we actually have to launch it out of the spacecraft with basically a, a mortar, which is a, kind of a stubby cannon and fire it out of the spacecraft uh, while the spacecraft's still going a thousand miles an hour. All right. um, so you can so, see the, the, all of the lines that are in between that pack and the camera were in that pack at some point. So you can, that, that's all coming out of that pack that's there. So this entire ca uh, cable or umbilical, whatever you want to call it, all the lines were inside that little pack 
talk about densely packing, right? I mean, that's, that's pretty crazy. And then what are these other pieces that are kind of flying off there? Yeah, if you look over to the left, the, the one that closest to the pack that kind of looks like a disc um, is actually the lid. Uh, it's the lid of the pair of the whole back shell. Um, and the parachute pushes through that lid to get out uh, to get out of the system. And that, that's what the cannon helps do um, is push things out. Uh, that lid is covered with a, a thermal protection system material to keep it nice, to keep the parachute nice and cool uh, during entry. Of course, we see a lot of heating uh, during entry as we come and streaking through the atmosphere. Uh, so that uh, that lid is important in keeping everything nice and cool. So the parachute is ready to function at the right temperature uh, when we want to use it here. All right. So um, if you look your... further down. Yep. Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Finish. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. Sure. If you look uh, down into the left a little bit from the from the lid, you can see the pieces that have popped off the lid. Um, the one to the uh, all the way down into the left, uh, the one that's uh, kind of furthest down, yeah, the one you're pointing out right now, um, was actually a piece of the lid uh, that's a piece of, that's a radome. It's actually uh, transparent to uh, radio waves uh, because it's on top of a antenna that we use mostly during cruise, but also a little bit during uh, EDL to communicate with Earth directly. Um, that wasn't supposed to pop off the lid originally. Uh, we were definitely concerned it might um, and tried to strengthen it uh, late in the game, but uh, it appears to have popped off. Again, it's not really a big problem. Uh, mostly we're just worried uh, when things come off that uh, we might that they might hit the parachute or hit the vehicle again. And it doesn't seem to have been a problem. It seems to have gone off to the left a little bit here. But that's that's where the engineering part of this is so useful, right? I mean, that that's going to help you design future spacecraft. You know that that didn't work exactly like you wanted. And so maybe you got to work on that uh, problem the next time a little differently. Yes. I mean, certainly uh, we would never have known if that had popped off. We would always be wondering. And in fact, we always wondered on curiosity if that same radome with that same design had popped off. And now we think maybe it did since we've seen it occur here at Jezero. Uh, you know, so it's, uh, it's certainly useful to know what's working and what's not. Um, and there's a way that we would be able to get any other kind of telemetry other than pictures that would help, see it, help us see that. And what's the concern when something like that pops off? Are you afraid it might uh, collide with the vehicle itself is, or are there other issues? The concern of putting things uh, behind us here uh, is that we're about to stop in front of it, right? When the parachute opens, the whole vehicle comes to a screeching halt. So anything that we've sent, in the be uh, sent behind us and then we stop in front of it is going to come back towards us. Uh, so that's our concern. Um, and in fact, we've seen this uh, in the past. If you look at some uh, ancient uh, Viking, Viking video of testing parachutes at high altitude, uh, you can see some things come back through the parachute and, and cut a hole uh, in the parachute. Oh, that's uh, not good. Yeah. So that's a, that's a concern. And we certainly didn't want any of those pieces to hit the vehicle either. Now, the sky is really big, right? So the, the good news is it's pretty unlikely to occur. Um, and we knew we were taking some risk here that, uh, that some of these pieces uh, might come back. Uh, but the, the parachute itself was actually pretty resilient to, to, uh, to local damage. Although, as you can see here on the right, uh, it looks pretty pristine. I mean, that looks like a brand new parachute over there on the right. Uh, you can't see uh, any evidence of any damage. Uh, although you're gonna, you're, we've been already zooming in on all our stills, trying to see if there's anything that we notice uh, at all weird. I gotta go back here because here's what blows me away. You, uh, pay attention to the right screen, which is real time. And what amazes me is how quickly this thing inflates. Let's play it in real time, watch. It's, it's instantaneous, right? Is that is that how it was designed? Did you expect to see it do that? Absolutely. Actually, this is oddly a tad slower than we expected uh, to inflate on Mars. This was about 0.7 seconds or so. Uh, really? The Curiosity parachute inflated in about 0.6 seconds. Uh, so this was a slow poke relatively, but uh, you know, compared to shoots opening here on Earth, uh, this is you know it's over in an instant, right? You can't even uh, if you blink, you'll miss it. Um, and think about the size of this parachute, right? This is a 70 foot diameter parachute. You know that's the bigger the bigger part of a uh, of an in, of a little league infield. It's basically the entire little league infield, right? <laughs> so this parachute snaps open in uh, 0.7 seconds. Um, it's quite a jolt to the rest of the spacecraft as well because we're pulling uh, tens of thousands of pounds of force here at this point. And you're looking very carefully as you go through this, I imagine, at all of these shrouds, all these lines, just to make sure everything isn't tangled. Does it look like it was pretty clean? Yeah, we can see that the lines were pretty clear. We've got two miles of lines. On this parachute. Wow. Uh, another thing I didn't get a chance to that, that I haven't pointed out that you can see clearly actually in this frozen version here. Uh, if you look kind of up at the uh, 12 o'clock position around the vent, so the vent is the hole in the middle of the parachute. Uh -huh. uh, first of all, that oh. vent is very circular, so that means right that here? we had a very good inflation. And then you see that little black splotch actually yeah. there? Yeah. That's actually the bag. 
the bag that had the parachute in it with oh, all cool. the lines. Um, that bag is retained. It's, it's held onto the top of the parachute. And what you're actually seeing is the shadow of that bag. The, bag, the bag's on the other side of the parachute. Oh, um, and cool. you play this a little bit, you'll see that the, uh, that shadow dances around Here the, we go. Let's the watch top it. of the Let's... parachute. Uh, right, you'll so see it move. I'm going to play it. It might, watch it might be the... easier to see in the slow-mo. Is this, there a method uh, to that pattern it. in that shoot? Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see it go. It's, you see that it's dance like around? See that shadow move around? Yeah. 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 Another thing, right? We never knew whether that, uh, what would happen to that bag, right? Does it sit in the middle of that vent where that, uh, where there's a hypersonic jet coming through there, a supersonic jet coming through the middle of that? Um, does it get torn off, right? Did we, did we make it strong enough so that the bag wouldn't get ripped off sitting back there? Uh, or does the bag slap the parachute and, uh, and create holes or create other damage from friction burns or something? We didn't know. Uh, we weren't completely sure. So now here we can can see that uh, it moves pretty easily back there. We can see that shadow dancing and we know that that, that bag didn't come off. There are definitely some people who thought on curiosity that the bag just tore straight off. Uh, but now we know at least on, uh, on perseverance here that it, that it didn't. Andy, you have a question. Uh, yeah, I was just kind of curious if there was a method for that pattern in the shoot. Does that give you some kind of unique uh, understanding of where the, how the shoot is situated? Yeah, patterns are certainly helpful for us in understanding, uh, first of all, the orientation of the parachute, right? Which way is it clocked? Um, and uh, and as it inflates, especially when you're looking at multiple uh, cameras at the parachute, which piece of the parachute is which and where is it going? Um, but it also gave us a little bit of an opportunity uh, to send a message out uh, to uh, to folks about uh, who we are and what we believe in. That's uh, that's encoded in that in that parachute as well. Uh, so we're encouraging people to uh, to take a look and see if they can figure it out. Really? Oh, seriously? No, give give us some clues, will you? There's something there in there that we need to figure out. I can't ruin the fun, right? We've got to uh, make sure that uh, people get a chance to see what we're, what we're trying to say. All right. So my radar audience, uh, Andy, is, is, there, is there some swag in it for somebody who figures this out? Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Show your work, right? This is uh, science and engineering. Yeah, that should work. Try, try to crack the code. Well, There's something. So just to give you an idea, though, it's something about humanity and exploration, maybe? Or what is it? I think that's pretty good. You could you could argue that, yeah. All right. Now I'm really curious. All right. So I, I imagine now people are going to be very busy trying to sort this one out. All right. So let's move on. Uh, anything else we should talk about? That was that's a pretty cool uh, thought right there. Anything else you're seeing here that was um, either really awesome or of concern to you? Not really. I mean, uh, the, the parachute, if you go back a few frames to the initial inflation, um, was a really symmetric inflation. We worry about that a lot, actually, given that the, the inflation is so violent um, and that it occurs so quickly. Uh, you can see when it first inflates that it has very few lobes um, and that uh, it, it's very symmetric. Sometimes you get these uh, asymmetric inflations that can really cause a lot of motion in the vehicle or can be dangerous to the parachute itself. Sometimes you can get things that we call it inversions where one side of the parachute will pull through lines of the other one and destroy the parachute. So this was a very organized, very symmetric. Um, it's exactly what we want to see. You know, some evidence of that is that uh, that circle in the middle, which is that uh, that vent at the top of the parachute. Uh, that, uh, that's circular right from the beginning, um, which is a great sign that you're going to have a good inflation. All right. I, I kind of jumped ahead. apologize. But here we are. Now we're looking no downward. Oh, no, I'm sorry. This is the, uh, right. the, yeah, is the heat shield, which is beneath the craft. And this is looking That's right. downward. So we're looking we're downward from the rover downlook camera. Okay. So let's take a look at this and just tell us what you're looking for here. And, and I'll just play it through once and then we can go back. Let's watch it. Okay. So it, uh, is that the way it should have looked? Uh, are you expected it to look, I should say? Pretty good. I think we'll go back and, uh, and do a lot of analysis on the image to see if the heat shield fell away at the rate that we expected it to, but it didn't, but it's basically what we expected. Um, and this is a much higher frame rate than we had uh, for similar imagery on Curiosity. Uh, so we can do a lot more with this. Uh, we were looking to see if the uh, heat shield would start tumbling uh, or if anything was wrong with it. Um, it also gives us a chance to see the hardware itself that's on the heat shield. Um, another useful part of this too is, as you can see here, we're swinging around on shoot. So as we're hanging under the shoot, the, uh, the whole system can kind of oscillate like this, or you can uh, be what, what we call a risk mode. The capsule itself can be, can be shaking. Um, and you can see that it's not too bad. Um, if you pause early on in the video and maybe back up a couple of frames, you get a nice clean look at what the heat shield looks like and all the hardware that's on there. So, um, and you can um, see some of got, our favorite the, friends. You've got some cable. It looks like that's Kapton covered cable there. What's that all about right there? That's right. 
So if you look kind of at the three o'clock position, there's a black box that all that uh, all that gold covered, all that captain co captain covered uh, cabling uh -huh. is going right in here. to connecting into. Uh, that's the uh, Medley Electronics box. Uh, Medley Two is the Mars EDL instrumentation suite. Um, so this helps us collect uh, both aerodynamic uh, information from the heat shield and uh, aerothermal, basically temperatures uh, from the heat shield. In fact, we already know that the uh, heat shield uh, did really well. We basically lost none of the thermal protection system material on the outside. Um, and that uh, we easily survive the heating uh, from entry. See that box, that's the electronics box, and uh, it can do a bunch of sensors. So if you hold lines around uh, to the various places, they connect to sensors that are on the heat shield. Uh, that's that what, sticks that's through what the all heat this shield. stuff uh, is Some of them are actually holes. Yeah. What are, what are these right. here? You can kind of see little... in the, like, I, I think on the... These things on the yeah, edge that look like go... ticks on a clock. What are those all about? Yeah, so there are nine uh, separation bolts and springs on the heat oh. shield that help it get off. Um, so we use explosive bolts. Uh, so when the heat shield is attached to the rest of the spacecraft, uh, we have these bolts that are tightened to keep the heat shield on. We don't want that falling off by any means until we want it to. Um, so right before this video was shot, we fired those uh, fired those explosives to blow up, blow apart those bolts um, and see springs that are on each of those points, except for one of them, uh, where the springs are helping to push that heat shield off. I mean, that heat shield's on the order of 500 kilos, like a, it's like a thousand pounds. Um, so it's really heavy. Uh, and that's why we have these springs that are basically like super powered truck springs, right? There's a lot of energy in each of these springs to help make sure that we get that, uh, get that heat shield off. We don't want that thing to bang back into us uh, after we've separated it. Um, but one thing you might notice where your cursor right is, is right there is that uh, unlike some of the other places that are around, uh, around the edge of the, of the uh, heat shield, you can see a spring that's loose. Uh, that spring seems to have come loose. And if you watch that in the video, uh, that'll rattle around on the inside of the heat shield and move, make its way toward the nose. All right, I'm going to play it. Well, uh, that's watch not, it. Well, stay stay yeah. focused on the spring and watch what happens as it goes down. You can see it moving around. Yeah, there it goes. Yeah, it. Did it separate it completely or was it still attached there, at right? some point, do you think, Al? Uh, I think it probably came off uh, right, or, right when we fired those explosive bolts. I mean, we are literally firing explosive bolts springs yeah. so it's not necessarily surprising and this on our our issues list uh try to tie those down and we try to tie them down as best as possible um and eight of the nine seem to have stayed put um whereas this one came off i should note that there was no risk to the spacecraft uh based on this yeah. right this the spring itself is quite heavy uh so it's going to fall away even if it wasn't stuck on the heat shield it would from the space get out of there uh, but really not what we intended and it's something that uh we didn't see uh, percent expect here and we wouldn't have seen it without this video well there's a couple it, other things that are interesting here too yeah go ahead we're picture. listening go ahead uh if you kind of look at the i guess the eight o'clock position you can kind of see a t like a white t stripe toward the middle a little bit right here uh, away from that dot yeah right there you see that uh -huh. um what you're actually seeing i think here is something we saw on curiosity which is there are seams so the inside of the heat shield is black and you kind of see it's kind of like uh, undulating a little bit there. And mm -hmm. that's because there's thermal blankets on the heat shield. Um, the heat shield is really cold. And we put the rest of the spacecraft inside the aeroshell. Um, it's really cold during cruise, I should say, on our way to Mars. It gets pretty hot on the way in. Uh, right. But before we enter the atmosphere, the heat shield is really cold. Um, so we have a whole bunch of these thermal blankets on the heat shield, uh, multi-layer insulation blankets, to keep the stuff inside warm. But the heat shield is still the coldest part of the spacecraft uh, before it gets to Mars by quite a bit. Um, so what you're actually seeing there are seams in the uh, in those blankets. And what's happened is that uh, volatiles, basically things that can uh, kind of uh, come out of the spacecraft after we launch, have settled on the coldest part of the spacecraft, which is the heat shield. So we're getting this kind of bit of frost uh, right along the seams. I mean, if you, if you look really carefully at some of the pictures, you can actually see some of that frost both in those seams and breaking off. Uh, if you look at uh, look at this carefully, you, you'll see some of them pop off. I saw some of them float to the right uh, last I looked at this video. Um, but basically, that starts on those seams and then is popping off as we fire those uh, those explosive bolts. Um, Very cool. And, uh, so let's leave, play that. So can we, can we see that as it goes down? Let's take a look if, if we can see that. Yeah, play it back and forth oh, yeah. a little bit. You'll see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some I of it see. Went yeah, off to yeah. the right. Did you see this on that go? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And some I of see it's it. float, see it. floating right above the heat shield. Yep, right in here. All these little specks here, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. See some of it floats around right in front of the heat yeah. shield. Yeah. Um, and we think that's all that it's all. Yeah, you can see some of them turning. I see one now at the like 330 yeah. position toward yeah. the middle. Um, there's a piece of white that's uh, flopping around there. Um, and we think it's that frost that was on uh, on the seams. Yeah. 
Okay, that's pretty cool. So um, anything, so you, I mean, well, the, the spring doesn't seem in the grand scheme to be a huge deal, but will you look at redesigning that somehow or is that on the, on the list of priorities not a big deal? Uh, it's certainly on our list to take a look at anything that, uh, that is, is on our list. And we have, we've got a running list of things right now. Um, it's not a big deal. Um, it, it, this behaved the way we wanted it to, it to uh, in terms of the overall performance of the heat shield going. And I think when we do a full reconstruction of the heat shield path and all that, we're going to see that we got plenty of force uh, from all those springs, including that spring uh, before it came off. So I think things look pretty good here. All right. So let's, let's let that play out. And then, from here, we go to uh, the camera that is on the rover looking up. Is that correct? Is that where we're headed now? That's correct, though. If you keep going with this, actually, uh, we see some yeah. more things that are going on later on. Um, we're on the chute for about a minute here, uh, and you can see us swinging around here and still slowing down on the parachute. That's why every, the ground looks so tilted right now uh -huh. um, is because as the parachute inflates, right, we're still going sideways. We're still going, you know, 22 degrees down angle, and then the heat shield comes off. As we slow down, we start ourselves shoots on top and the vehicles below and we're starting to look more straight down. Um, you can actually see a couple of things that we think are happening here too, that we are drifting a little bit on the wind um, to the east away from the, uh, from the Delta. Uh, so that's too. We also get a chance to see how much uh, motion we have on shoot, which has been a concern in the past. Um, motions like, like Scaparelli, for example, uh, saw, saw a lot of uh, angular motion on shoot, a lot of swinging back and forth. Um, which unfortunately ultimately led to their demise. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a big deal for us to collect that information and to see what's going on here. Al, I so have the, a question. It's, it's, yeah, go ahead, Kate. Uh, is this when uh, the uh, terrain relative navigation is kicking in right about now? I'm um, in a little bit. I think here. Uh, and then uh, when we get down to about 4,200 meters, that's when terrain relative navigation kicks in. Um, but it's pretty close to right here. We've actually started just now to... Uh, Return, we've returned about a quarter of the train relative navigation images so far. Um, so about here is when it should be working, uh, doing its matching. And oh, I saw... know. That was important just now. There was uh, that flash. I want to tell, yeah. tell people about that flash. Uh, Al, what are we seeing when that, hang on here. I want to make sure people see this and we can talk about it. Uh, it's covered over a little bit. I'm trying to figure out why it's doing that, but hang on one second. Yeah, you'll there see that go. flash kind of in the upper upper right of the uh, image, kind of right, upper here center, we go. upper Let's right. Let's go back here and... All right, so I'm going to play it and look in the upper right and check this out. It's kind of cool moment because it's an important moment to be sure. And this is a little bit past that, I think. I think you've missed Am I on the wrong here, side of it? I believe. Oh, I yeah, you're on the back? wrong side of it. I think okay. you got back hang a little on, bit. Hang on, let me go back a little more. Uh, you can kind of use a little cue on the back, back shell separation, which is what you're seeing in that little graphic at the very bottom. So, oh, that would help, wouldn't it? Yeah. All right, so I think I'm okay now. Let's see. So if you start from here, yeah, in this yeah, neighborhood. Should be good now. Okay, so look in the upper right. And see here, we're still swinging on shoot. And then there it goes. Okay, so at that moment, yeah, uh, you uh, separated from the back shot. That's right. That's right. That's, that's a that's big the, deal, I think right? We think Right? Yeah, absolutely. Getting now we're done with the parachute, right? We've been going, we've been heading at the ground at uh, 60 to 200 miles an hour or so at this point. Um, and uh, we're dropping out of the back uh, due to stray light that's uh, basically the lighting condition changing uh, on the vehicle as the whole power descent vehicle drops out of that back shell that's been covering it. Uh, so here now we've begun, we've lit up the engines and start that, started that, uh, that powered flight portion. Um, we ends with that huge, uh, huge divert that we did. Uh, we flew away from the delta actually to find the safest spot that we could that we could land on, um, which was a bit to the southeast. Um, and you can see, kind of, basically the only way we can turn is by facing our engines away from uh, uh, from where we're going, so we can we can kind of push ourselves that way. And then once we get there, we have to reverse that turn and put the engines the other way. Uh, once we've gotten down up to above the site, we slow down. So we we out uh, from that. 160 miles an hour, 60 miles an hour, down to about two miles an hour at this point. Um, and then do this. All right. So what, what kind of blew me away there as it's coming in, first of all, it's really hard to tell. That, that's just so amazing. All these shots are just incredible. But uh, it's very hard to tell. There you guys are uh, rightly so excited. Uh, it's hard to tell how close you are to the surface there. And all of a sudden you see dust and you go, oh, that's not a giant boulder. That's just a little pebble, right? You know, there's yeah, like no roughly, frame of reference, right? 
roughly how far off the ground are you from here? Yeah, like right here, you're close, right? Why, you, uh, do you know roughly the altitudes as you go down here? Yeah, we're pretty close here. Like at this point, uh, we're, let's see, if we're doing that part of the river, I'm trying to, to make sure I'm catching up with uh, with what you're seeing. Uh, so we, we drop out of the back shell at about, uh, about 2.1 kilometers. Um, so that's wh where we start. Uh, and then by the time we be, we get vertical, we're only uh, about uh, on the order of 100 meters above the surface. Oh, uh, so when you when this kind of stop uh, comes back down and looks straight down, we're so 60 to 100 meters above the surface. Uh, and then we throw on the brakes uh, even more uh, to get down to where Sky Crane starts. So Sky Crane starts about 20 meters above the ground or so. Uh, so that's kind of where we are right about here, I think, in the image. Uh, as uh -huh. you see that we're kicking up uh, dust and then the rubber rates. Um, once the rover comes down, it, it's about seven and a half meters below the uh, below the stage, when it's fully down, um, as it is right about there. Uh, and then, of course, at touchdown, uh, the descent stage then is uh, only seven and a half meters above the surface. It's uh, it's really it would be cool to hear this. I know you were going to try to capture audio of this, but that didn't work out. But still, this is you can tell it's an incredibly dynamic thing. Yeah, I mean, we can see certainly uh, as the rover separates and the mobility deploys, that mobility deploying is kind of violent too. We just drop that mobility and kind of give the whole thing a big whack. Um, and you can see the, the rover shake. And, and in the rover upload camera, when you're looking at the descent stage, you can see that, that too, that the rover Boom. begins to shake. And yeah. then we deploy that bogey and it gives a little bit of shake as well there too. Um, so you can kind of see all that uh, all that action happening. Um, it, the ground the ground tests uh, where we deploy those mobility under under a descent, under a fake descent stage um, look just the same, right? We get this little pitch action uh, of the descent stage, uh, excuse me, of the rover, and the descent stage stays still. Um, but we do have enough time there for that that uh, that pitching motion on the rover to kind of to dissipate before we touch down. So things are pretty much flat on the rover when the wheels hit the ground, which is exactly what we intended. So, all right, so just so people are clear, that's uh, the descent stage, that's the rover. This is looking down from the rover camera beneath it. Um, question for you that occurred to me, um, I know this is kind of a little bit of a wonky question, but where were the recordings? The recordings had to be on the rover, right? All, all these cameras that were you know, on the back shell, et cetera, did they feed down through one of these cables into the rover? Is that how you're able to get these uh, images uh, recorded and fed back to earth? Can you guys that again? I think you're coming in a little bit. Uh, wonky yeah, I'll, I'll try it one more time. I, I'm just, I was a little curious about how the, this was all recorded. If you have a camera on the back shell, yeah. was there a cable that ultimately took it down into the rover so that all the recordings were done on board the rover? I guess that would be the only way you'd get it, right? That's correct. There, there are definitely, we have uh, hubs in different places uh, in the vehicle that are, that are reaching out to those cameras. But ultimately, all the storage is on the rover. Uh, we have to get all that data down to the rover. Um, so, in fact, in this portion where we're doing the sky crane here, um, we have the camera. Actually, you can see the camera in the descent stage in the upper, upper image where we're looking at the. Uh, so, take a look at the top image there. Yep. Uh, yeah. Like, look up a little bit. Uh, you can see that little black dot uh, that that's right a little here? bit above where your cursor is right there. Yeah, right that's, the, uh, that's the descent stage down the camera. So, that's no what's kidding. producing the image that's on the bottom left. Oh, right? cool. that's, the, that's the guy looking, uh, looking down there. Uh, these, so that uh, all the data from that camera right now, right in this in this instant when this is being shot, uh, it's being sent down through that umbilical cable, which is over on the left. This uh, that guy, here. yeah, exactly, that yeah. kind of coily guy so uh, is our electrical <laughs> connection. That's right, yeah, there it is on the lower guy, sending it down there. Um, so we're sending that information right down to the rover and writing it quickly uh, to the uh, to the spacecraft because all our storage is on the rover, um, and that descent stage is going to leave. So we can't store any data on that descent stage, right, otherwise right. we're not going to have it later. So um, and and you can actually see the. Uh, what, go ahead. What else? If you look at the, if you look at the, uh, yeah, that one. Uh, if you move down, to, um, and, that it? and down more, you see a little black dot. Yeah, right there. That's, that's the uh, the rover uplook camera. So that's producing the image that's on the top. That's getting right? this. So picture. the rover is looking back up at the descent stage. So yep, exactly. So you can see what we're. That uh, camera right there. That's there right. That's exact. That, those are the two that you're seeing right there. That I love the totally uh, image cool. on the bottom left too. You can see a few other things if you zoom in on that still. The, uh, at some point, the uh, Perseverance, the, uh, the nameplate for the rover, is on the arm, uh, which is on the very front of the rover, and you can read it. It's easy to read, actually, if you, uh, if you pull up I one of the stills of the video. I don't think I can zoom video. in on this. I don't think I can do that. Yeah. Should, let me see if I can do that. But it, if you guys uh, take a look at it in the future, it's written yeah. right there at the front. So This will be something um, you can do. It. Kids, do this at home. But, uh, exactly. <laughs> so these are point-grade cameras. Rover, right? What? 
if you look at the back of the rover too, uh, there's that little arch that goes over the, the uh, that goes over the RTG over the power source. I don't know if you can point to that. Um, there's a little black part of it. Uh, I don't know where your cursor went. Yeah, right here. There you go. Is that uh, it? That's where that uh, there's a plaque there. Yeah, there's a plaque there with the chip. So I don't know if you guys put your name uh, in the uh, in the system to be sent to Mars. But if you're wondering where your where your name is, and along with uh, 11 million of your uh, of your frequent flyers, I guess that are on this uh, <laughs> fellow Earthlings. As well. That's I where assume... everyone's name is. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> I assume you're in there somewhere. Yeah, I think so. Uh, yeah. So yeah, that that little chip with our, our names is sitting right there. So. Exploring Mars together right there. <laughs> I'll tell you what I'm not seeing here is flames. Should there not be flames coming out of the business end of those uh, those rockets in the upper left-hand corner? What, what's going yeah, it's, on it, with that? It, it's kind of eerie, right, to look at those engines and not see flames coming out of them. That's what we're used to with rockets. Um, and most of those rockets, right, are, are combustion type of, of rockets. But here we're using hydrazine. Um, which actually burns doesn't really burn actually it's not a combustion it's not a combustion reaction uh, that that these engines use um, so what's really coming out of there the byproducts of the thrust that we're getting there are nitrogen and hydrogen which are clear um, so you actually will not see plumes from these you won't see smoke you won't see a bright light um, all you can see actually uh, is that the engines themselves are getting hot so if you get take a close look at uh, some of those images. And again, maybe a still would work here or if you take a look in the detail, it's easiest to see in the top right engine. Um, if you pause there somewhere, you can take a look um, just above the bell. So a little bit to the left, yeah, right there. You can see little streaks of pink blow it up. Um, and that's evidence that the thrust chamber is getting really hot because uh, those engines have been on for a minute now and those engines are quite hot. Uh, so you don't see any kind of smoke coming out of the out of the out of the bell itself because there isn't any, right? That's nitrogen and hydrogen coming out of there, and I can promise you, it's coming out of there in a hurry. Uh, but you can <laughs> see that the uh, that the the bell itself, right, right above the bell, the thrust chamber is very hot, and it's getting pink because it's so hot. We have ground test uh, video of our air on on Earth, um, and the same thing occurs, right? The uh, all you see, it's the kind of it, you think it's the most boring video ever. You think, are these engines on at all? Uh, but then it just begins to start glowing pink and you realize what's actually happening um, and that you should expect it to be clear, but the plume clear and you just. Um, Andy, yeah, yeah. you have a question. Yeah. Regarding some of the terrain relative data that you mentioned that you're downloading, uh, does that give you the opportunity to kind of go over um, what the Rover thought it saw uh, on the descent and allow you to kind of correct the models moving forward? Yeah, if the lander vision system camera is taking pictures of the ground, right, and doing that ma that matching on board, um, we actually keep running that camera all the way down uh, to the ground, uh, so we can basically understand what the vehicle was trying to do, uh, what it saw. Uh, it gives us plenty of information about where, what landmarks it thought it saw based on uh, what it sees in the camera versus what it has in the map, and trying to match those up. Um, and in fact, our preliminary analysis suggests that it did a great job doing that. Uh, it saw plenty of landmarks, dozens and dozens of landmarks that it recognized from its onboard map uh, in those images that's taken on the way down. Um, so we have a good, good indication that the, uh, the terrain relative navigation system worked really well. So, Once you pair that, that, that up, right, the, those landmarks and figure out where you are, um, the vehicle actually uses that information to fly to, to the target that is selected. Um, so it selected a particular target that was safe, uh, and we only missed it by five meters, uh, you know, 15 or so uh, from where we were aiming. Uh, so it aimed for a safe spot and we managed to nail it, which is a good sign that the uh, train relative nav system really, really knew where we were. So that speaks a lot to the value of the uh, previous reconnaissance missions, right? Because they're, they're the ones that gathered the initial data. Can you ask that question again? I, I think it broke up there for me. Y yeah. So would you say that probably speaks uh, a lot towards the value of the previous reconnaissance missions that gathered the initial data and kind of establishes how valuable they are? Absolutely. I mean, I think the, uh, the, the, the value from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter and kind of putting together this Mars program where we have this orbiter that can collect this kind of information uh, with that foreknowledge that we might try to use it like that uh, was absolutely essential. Uh, those, we, we made the highest quality maps I think we ever have for any site on Mars um, and we use them to good effect here. Okay, so let's let's look ahead now to you know the, the retriever mission. Well, I, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna dub it the the Labrador mission. The retriever is gonna come and get the samples <laughs> yeah. off the surface. Uh, how much does this uh, raise the bar for the likes of you 
on accuracy when you've got to hit a spot, you know, and try not to in, get yourself involved in a really long Easter egg hunt for these samples, which you hope to leave on the surface. Yeah, I think that this is a great sign for uh, for our future missions that we are able to hit a particular spot. Um, you know, the only difference between basically, uh, you know, landing like we did and trying to find little parking lots that are nearby and what the future is trying to do is a lot of fuel. Um, if you add more fuel to our system, given you know where we are down to a couple tens of meters and we're able to hit a spot down to five meters, if you use more fuel, we can think we think we can hit that at any spot on Mars pretty much. Uh, so we want to pick a nice safe safe one, of course, to, to touch down on. Uh, but the fact that the terrain relative navigation system performs so well uh, means that we can we think we can hit uh, very tight spots and hopefully those spots are safe. That way we don't have to design a vehicle um, that is quite as rugged, right? We don't have to prepare to land on all sorts of rough terrain if we know the spot we're going to is safe. Uh, I think a big deal when we're talking about landing something as big as the uh, future missions will require, especially given that we want to put a rocket on Mars. Excellent. Any other questions? That was just awesome, Al. Really, thank you for walking us through that. Uh, what a thrill it was to see the, the pictures, but to see it through your eyes is a, a special opportunity. And I'm challenging the MyRadar community to figure <laughs> out the code in the parachute. And uh, I'll leave it up to Andy to figure out what, uh, what he's offering you in return for that. But uh, Al, um, hopefully uh, we'll get an answer back to you soon. And uh, you can... Um, understand that we've got some smart people out there in our audience, but congratulations on your efforts and uh, great work. And thanks, thanks for giving us such a great show. It really gives us an opportunity to be a part of uh, a great adventure, a great exploration. Uh, you know, I think there's probably a lot of young people watching this right now who uh, are inspired and that's important, isn't it? No, it's absolutely critical to me that, uh, that we think of this as it is, right? That we are exploring together. We're exploring Mars together. Um, we're just trying, we're just the ones trying to make it happen. Uh, but we want to take everyone along for the ride. And uh, that's why we want to put everything out there like this. Uh, so you can take a look and see what we're seeing too. And, uh, and help us help us all explore Mars. All right. Al Chen, EDL lead for Mars Perseverance. Um, you um, deserve a little bit of rest and relaxation. Uh, but uh, please uh, savor and bask in the glory of the moment. Uh, thank you uh, very much for your time. And uh, thank you guys for joining in. And thank you for watching for my radar. I'm Miles O'Brien. Follow my radar on social media Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Download my radar on iOS, Android, Amazon Alexa, Xbox, and Windows.